Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be um, here. Uh, it's an important moment in the life of the church uh, globally and in the United States. And so I, I, I really appreciate this opportunity because it, it allows me to think more deeply about a few things um, that have happened in these last few years and that are going to happen because it, you may have heard uh, uh, today the news that um, on the 29th of October, President Biden, uh, Biden will be received in the Vatican by Pope Francis, which is two weeks from now. And the 29th of October will be two weeks before the US bishops meet in Baltimore for their fall assembly where they uh, supposedly will discuss the document on the Eucharist, which is uh, which which is an idea that uh, surfaced um, almost one year ago when Joe Biden, the second Catholic president, who, who, who was elected, um, and so it's a very interesting time. Uh, also, because as you know. Last week in the Vatican, Pope Francis um, opened the synodal process uh, uh, leading to the Synod of Bishops in Rome of October 2023. And what is supposed to happen in every diocese in the world, included in, the, in this country, next Sunday, this Sunday, in two and a half days, is that every bishop should open a synodal process. Um, locally in our diocese. So it, it's a very, very important moment. Um, and with, with all possible humility, I mean, someone who was born and raised in, in Italy and, and came to this country only 13 years ago, uh, I, I, I'll try to offer some ideas about the intersection uh, of the church, uh, of faith and public life in this country in light of these last few years that in my opinion have been revealing of some dynamics um, of, of our time. So here, why is this moment uh, very particular? Well, because if something happens all, all, only twice in more than two centuries, it means that we should pay attention and so this is the second time this country, uh, as a Catholic president, uh, Joe Biden, and, and it's very different from the, the time of the first Catholic president, John Kennedy. Uh, in 1960, the problem was, uh, can a Catholic be elected president? And it was a problem that was, was very clear in the, the minds of, of, of the Democratic Party, even before 1960, when, when young John Kennedy had the idea of running in, in, in 1956, and his party told him, it's not going to happen, it's, it's impossible. And so it did happen uh, in 1960, uh, and John Kennedy made it happen uh, also because of uh, his choice uh, of framing his, his Catholicism in, 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 in a particular way, in a way that was fundamentally private, not too public, which is very different from what we see from Joe Biden, who's a Catholic uh, in the full sense of the word, uh, is a very public Catholic, um, he is a very traditional one. Uh, he is very devout. Uh, in some sense, is not the typical Vatican II Catholic. Vatican II Catholics are not known for carry uh, for for carrying a rosary in, in their pockets, and so it's it's a particular kind of Catholic. But despite all of that, the problem Joe Biden faced uh, last year at the time of the, the election and still faces is not like at the time of Kennedy, can a Catholic be 
the president of the United States, but Joe Biden's problem is what kind of Catholic? <laughs> because uh, he is the wrong kind of Catholic in the eyes of many fellow Catholics uh, and of, of many other uh, who have a religious uh, faith in this country. And so this is an extraordinary moment in the life uh, of the United States, uh, which is still very much uh, inspired by a religious sense of itself, uh, even in, 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 uh, in those Americans who are not religious, America is religion in some sense. And so this is a very particular moment. What has happened? in these last few months or year that did not happen with John Kennedy in 1960. What has happened is that there has been the project or the attempt uh, by some Catholics and a good number of Catholic bishops um, of uh, declaring Joe Biden not Catholic anymore or of abandoning Joe Biden uh, to in a place that was deserted by church leadership. This is something that is still in the works, in the minds of some. Uh, there's still a, a, an attempt go, going on for very serious reasons. Uh, abortion is a very serious moral matter that uh, has been framed in the, in, in the legislation of this country in ways that are quite different from the way it has been legislated by European countries, for example. So I think it would be a mistake to underestimate or belittle the, the serious concerns that some have for uh, some very serious moral issues in, in this country. But despite all that, I believe there is a very, very serious problem in this attempt of church leaders to uh, abandon in public and at the highest public level, which is in liturgy, a Catholic who serves as president of the United States. And I'm very sensitive to this, despite my being Italian, by being, I mean, not, not being a US citizen, because this reminds me of something that happened just a couple of years before I left Italy in 2007, when there was uh, a very committed public Catholic serving as prime minister, uh, Romano Prodi, the antagonist, the opponent of Silvio Berlusconi, you may have heard of him. Mm -hmm. And I remember that what Italian bishops did with Romano Prodi, um, a very faithful Catholic, was to declare him persona non grata, uh, a, a Catholic that they did not want to deal with. And most remarkably, back then, the Cardinal President of the Italian Bishop Conference was the same uh, clergyman who, as a young priest, had uh, celebrated the marriage of the young, uh, uh, a future Prime Minister, Romano Prodi, the same person. <laughs> So that was an extraordinary. So I've seen before bishops abandoning and declaring this Catholic prime minister or president, head of state, we don't like him, we don't want to deal with him. But what is happening in this country is more serious because we are talking about a US bishop conference that is debated, is debating a document who could send a message uh, um, aimed at excluding the second Catholic president from communion. So which is something that goes against not just canon law, because 
the, the Bishop Conference has no jurisdiction, has no authority on this, but also goes against the tradition because there's never been anything like that. So I just want to offer a few thoughts about uh, all this that is happening from the point of view of an historian uh, and of a theologian who tries to step back a little from the day in, day out, noise of statements and so on. So here, what I, I believe the first um, element of context for these uh, considerations on the intersection of faith and public life is this, that clearly there is a new horizon that John Kennedy did not have to deal with at all the rise of uh, biopolitics, uh, life issues, uh, abortion, euthanasia, and then marriage, same-sex marriage, and so on. So that is something that is common to the church worldwide. It's not just America. It is Europe, it is Latin America, and it will be, or it is already in, in different fashions in other continents. But there's something more in this country, in, in in the United States, that the very old, centuries old uh, sectarian temptations that really do not belong to the Catholic worldviews to divide the world in, in good and bad people found in this country an extraordinary um, uh, device to amplify that mentality, which is a two-party system, which you don't have in, in any other major country where there is a sizable Catholic population. What is the product of this two-party system? Uh, it is a two-party church. We have a two-party Catholic church. And so this um, is not just something that affects the behavior at the, at the polls every four or two years, but it has penetrated really the minds of Americans, of, of our minds and of Catholics. So here there is um, the attempt of using the sacraments and the personal faith of a Catholic whose position on some policies is exactly the same of roughly 50% of his fellow Catholics. The temptation is to use these sacraments um, uh, not just as the weapon, but as, as uh, a counter sacrament. So it is one of the many uh, contradictions, not paradoxes, because paradoxes are essential for the faith, but real contradictions, which are negative things, which the most important debate we are having about communion in this country, it's about excluding someone from communion. And so excluding the most visible Catholic leader of this country. Um, so here there is, I believe, there's something at, at the heart of this that we should consider very seriously. It is one of the uh, effects of reducing everything, uh, even religion, even our faith, even the church, a, a certain healthy sense of the of the of of the church, of reducing that to the plane of an exclusively uh, social and political level. As if the fact that one goes to, to, to receive communion uh, is not something that is, first of all, uh, political, but it, 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 it is, first of all, uh, 
religious. It has to do with his faith, with, with what happens um, after we are not here anymore. Okay, so this is something that has penetrated, I believe, in fairness, both the right and the left, the reduction of the life of the church, of uh, the fundamental elements of, of, of the Catholic faith, even the sacraments to the level of what is politically uh, usable, what is politically expedient. That is a perversion that uh, we um, have seen very clearly in these last few months um, with, uh, with what's happening with uh, Joe Biden. Now, there is a particularly dangerous version of this association of religion and politics, of, of Catholicism and a political ideology on the right. That uh, is, I don't have to tell you that, uh, is on the right. It's something that we Vatican to Catholics should wake up finally, that it's, it's not something that will go away and will end up in the dustbin of history. It is there. It is something we have to not to dismiss um, as remains of a past history. It is, it, it, it is our history. Now here, there are some things that are, uh, are coming up in a particularly strident and vocal opposition, if not condemnation, uh, of Joe Biden um, and of his presidency coming from a, a conservative uh, Catholic culture that is very interesting because it is basically the blow by blow description of what one of the greatest Catholic theologians of the 20th century, Yves Congar, a French Dominican, one of the most influential advisors at the Second Vatican Council, described as the typical political theological ideology of uh, the extreme right. And there's a very interesting uh, appendix to his book of 1950 on the true and false reform of the church. Um, he had a second edition of that book in 1968, a fateful year. That's 1968 edition of that book at a preface that he write he, that he wrote looking from his windows at what was happening in the streets of Paris in May 1968. So extremely attentive to what was happening. So here Congar wrote a very interesting couple of pages on the connection that there are between uh, what he called uh, right-wing mentality and integralism. And I believe that with minimal adaptations is something that we, we could use to understand uh, some fundamental features of the uh, attempt of conservative Catholic culture in this country to distort uh, a healthy balance in our Catholic faith. So here there are eight elements that Congar in 1968, identified as typical of, it, of the connections between right-wing mentality and integralism or Catholic in, 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 in integralism. Number one, a deep pessimism about human nature. Number two, belief in the need of strong authority. Three, distrust of any doctrinal development. 
Number four, an inclination to make sure that, that, that Catholicism doesn't become too easy. Number five, an emphasis on dogmatic formulas over the subjective reality of faith. Six, preference for deductive reasoning over inductive reasoning. Seven, ecclesial authoritarianism or dictatorship in the church. Number eight, last one, the idea that the ecclesiology of the church should be shaped not by the mystical dimension, but by a rigid hierarchy. <laughs> this is striking because, I mean, almost 60 years ago, Yves Congar described with uh, shocking precision something that has remained a typical uh, part of, 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 of this uh, connection between right-wing mentality and Catholic integralism. Now, why is this coming to an explosive moment right now in this country, in the United States, in this, uh, in this juncture between faith and public life? Well, because Pope Francis is stuck between the global church and American politics. He's a global pope for a church that is becoming much more global than before. Uh, but when he talks to American Catholics, to uh, US bishops, uh, he has to deal in one way or another with American politics and, and not just American church politics because all bishops in the world in every country, they do church politics, all of them, right? But with uh, Congress politics, Senate politics, Supreme Court politics, this is happening right now because what we have seen, as I said earlier, in this country, the two-party system has created a two-party church has created a, 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 a two-party church in a particular way because a majority of the US bishops um, have become, and this is, a, a, I mean, it's a funny joke, but it, it, it happens to be real. I mean, they uh, look like the Republican party at prayer. That is what has happened. So here we have uh, that the leadership of the Catholic Church in this country has accepted, has interjected in their bodies, in their minds, in their souls, this idea that the world is made of two parties. And therefore, the church is made of two parties. And so a certain language, a certain idea of the other, a certain way of framing the issues um, has, has started to mirror the language, the tactics, the, the imagination of a political party. Uh, and I'm not blaming any one individual uh, leader in this. I believe there is uh, uh, a wide uh, responsibility that go back many years that is not just of diverse bishops, but it is part of uh, the commentariat of, uh, the, of uh, the elites that have a voice in, 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 in the church. So we have this very particular moment because on the one hand, we have Joe Biden, a Catholic who was elected president um, way after 
anyone could imagine uh, that he, he could be elected because if you remember the 2015, 2016, he said, I'm, I'm out of here. It is, I'm not be running, uh, I'm going to be running. So that is a surprising element. And so this is the first element that is causing uh, waves, uh, the troubles um, on, this, uh, on this issue. But on the other side, there is also Pope Francis. And now in the Catholic Church, and, and, and this is something that it would require hours to um, explain that, but the papacy as a ministry in the church, as a function, is essentially incompatible with the idea of a two-party church. The papacy um, has been imperial for so many centuries, monarchical. You can throw at the papacy many things, but if there's one thing that makes me attracted to that history is that it's a function that is essentially the opposite of a partisan leader. And so this is something that we have seen lately. We have a papacy that has become less patient with the partisanship uh, of some church leaders uh, in this country, but not only. And on top of that, you, you have Pope Francis, who's a Jesuit from Latin America, uh, who has a critical view of the United States, um, of America in general. Uh, for him, modern history, yes, begins with America, but with Latin America, not North America. It's, it's a completely different view of modern history, when his history starts, he has no patience with this idea that the United States um, has uh, a special blessing coming from God, that the United States has a special destiny in world's history, the beacon and all of that. You cannot expect that from Pope Francis. And so that is something that has, I believe, um, upset the expectations um, and the understandings of many Catholics in this country that had become used to something that was not obvious and that happened for a series of reasons which is the pontificates of John Paul II and of Pope Benedict XVI, almost 35 years, two popes who were Americanophile, who looked at the United States with a very keen eye because of anti-communism, because of the pushback on life issues. On, on, uh, and so at least two generations of Catholics in this country got used to the idea that the papacy and the United States are natural allies. Well, that has never been true between 1978 um, and 2013 was an, an exception. And so now Pope Francis has, has brought back some realism and some pragmatism that has to do with Joe Biden and this particular situation, but also because there is a papacy that um, is getting back some of its um, uh, ministry in not acting in a partisan way, not just domestically in this country, but for example, on, on the world stage. A Pope that visits Iraq sends a particular kind of message, and I don't have to uh, explain you what, what kind of message that is. Okay. My final point is this. So here, there are many problems um, 
in the intersection between faith and public life. Um, uh, the usual uh, progressive or liberal pieties that we used to exchange in the 1990s uh, were upset uh, and were no longer valid really after 9-11 of 2001. Uh, it's even worse uh, in these last few years um, after Brexit, uh, the ecological crisis um, should force all of us to re-examine our comfort zone, what we think the role of the church and, 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 and a religion should be in public life or shouldn't, all of us. On the immediate uh, short term, I believe that the biggest uh, problem and temptation is the temptation of sectarianism. This idea that we can save ourselves by retreating or remaining in our small isolated worlds. So uh, you may have heard of this book that was published in 2009, The Big Sword. I mean, how Americans have become more uh, uh, trench, entrenched in their communities where everyone votes in the same way, reads the same stuff, looks the same. Well, this is happening in the church as well. You may have heard of, 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 uh, of uh, the Benedict Option. There is on the market of the Catholic Church a number of very attractive products, uh, boutique liturgies, um, uh, uh, religious cyber identities that are tailored are customized for all of us. The church is something bigger. It's supposed to be bigger. It's supposed to have people together that do not look the same, do not think the same, do not vote the same way. Uh, in Augustine's terms is uh, per mixta. It's, it's a mixed body not just of saints and sinners, uh, I mean, mostly sinners, as we all know, but also uh, of people that are different, look different, think differently. And so this sorting out, this big sort, is hap has happened in our social life, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, our economic life, but also in, in, in our church. And this is, I believe, the biggest danger of, the, of, of this discussion that is happening with Joe Biden and the Eucharist and so on, because it may be, I mean, this time may be the policies on abortion. Okay, but next time will be something else. And in the end, we will find a church where um, the idea of being together at liturgy together, uh, despite everything, uh, will be lost. And I, and I, I'm not sure what happens the day after that concept is lost. As a theologian, as a historian, as a Catholic, I believe this is uh, an utter perversion of the idea of the liturgy and of the idea of the church. Um, and of course, this is something that calls all of us to re-examine our sense of, of the church. All of us have some issues at heart that we think are decisive um, and we should continue to cherish them and work for them, uh, be active, advocate, but at the same time, if that idea of the agenda becomes overwhelming, um, it can really uh, lead to a very dangerous moment 
in the life of, of the church, which is already very fragile, very unstable for so many reasons. So this is, I believe, the, the time of recovering a certain sense of the church, sensus ecclesiae, uh, that um, is, is being uh, threatened by an overwhelming social, political uh, element. So here there is no Christian message that is credible if it's not visible in what we do of course but there's also something that should be kept safe um, from the day-by-day -day political uh, controversies um, and this is uh, this moment is one of those moments where we see that risk being the highest um, and so here I've, I've offered you a few thoughts and I'm very happy to be here and, and I'm very curious uh, to hear from you and to hear your uh, questions, but also comments. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I've got pages and pages of notes already. Um, so we are going to open this up for a few questions. We won't be able to take too many, but I would uh, ask you to, we have a system where you can either put up your hand with that little uh, reaction button, or you can physically raise your hand uh, so you can let me know. And when I see you, I will call on you and, um, and uh, uh, you can ask your questions. So uh, please go ahead and uh, put those out there. Oh, one of the, th uh, okay, I see a hand is raised. Uh, let's see, Brad, uh, go ahead. Why don't you ask your question, Brad Pritz? You'll have to unmute, Brad. Uh, we can't. There we Sorry go. about that. That's okay. Go Thank on. you, Professor, for, it's a very insightful talk. Uh, I've had the privilege of hearing you before and glad to hear you once again. Uh, my question is this, this goes to the, the point of excommunication. And I'm aware of several situations. Uh, first, in principle, I have to say, an organization ought to have the right to excommunicate. The question is how and why. And in the past, there was a traditional way, which was if there was a teacher or bishop or someone who taught against the church, they'd be given an opportunity to recant. And if they chose not to, then they might be excommunicated. Martin Luther, I can, here I stand, I can do no other uh, and others. Second, for some odd reason, we chose to extend that to persons who marry, get a civil divorce, remarry without an annulment. And now we're talking about doing it for people who hold certain political views, at least political leaders. And my question is, I'm willing to accept that an organization ought to be able to choose who its members are. But why would these, why wouldn't the same opportunity for some kind of due process and discussion be afforded to people in category three, the political view, or even category two, the divorce and remarriage? Um, that was afforded to someone like Martin Luther, who arguably caused a lot more disruption, much of it positive. <laughs> anyway, that's my question. Should, should they reply immediately or you, or you want to gather some questions? No, go ahead and reply. Okay. We'll, we're, sure. This will just be back and forth. Sure. So uh, the present discussion on Joe Biden and the Eucharist is not really excommunication. It's exclusion from communion. Okay, it's a bit different. Okay, so uh, so you, you would not be deprived of a funeral, for example. It, it would be the Eucharist only. So it's a bit different here. Now, what, so you're right that those who want to go ahead 
and say Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi shouldn't go to the Eucharist uh, are, are not following procedure, you're right. Because canon law says a few things, uh, it should be the local ordinary. And if you ask a canon lawyer, he or she will tell you that in tradition, if there is a doubt on the admissibility of a head of state to communion, in history, it was all, always up to the Pope to make the final decision. So here the US bishops are really trying to enforce a law, but the law is not on their side. That's, that's one problem um, here. So on a side comment here, you're right, there are, so there is a due process um, in the church. So there's, a, or there should be the certainty of, of the law. Um, thank God that things are not always done by the book in the Catholic Church. <laughs> I mean, if, there, if they were done always by the, the book, it would be an insufferable church. Okay, so here you're right. In extreme cases, you have to know what are your rights, okay? Uh, but I'm, I'm, so... I know the bishops don't have the law on their side here. My preference is to make a theological argument may, that's based on prudence and on, on, on wisdom, much more than on the basis of the law. That's, that's, but you're right. So there is a legal aspect that... Uh, is being ignored by some of them. Thank you. I'll turn that back to the speaker and uh, ask the next uh, questioner to take over. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Barbara Finch, you have a question. Go ahead and unmute. There we go. Uh, Massimo, um, I, I find it very, uh, for you to comment, but I find it very contradictory. The bishops seem to be involved in partisan politics, but then when it comes to talking about the issues of our time, many, many bishops, many priests say it doesn't belong in church. And so we don't talk about racism at church. We don't talk about poverty or, or the climate or whatever sort of thing. So that's very contradictory. Um, and then secondly, um, the, the, the problem I have is uh, they said they wanted to do this anyway because of so that there wasn't uh, abuses of the Eucharist. However, Eucharist is supposed to be a sacrament of um, healing, forgiveness, inclusion, and union. And yet we want to find so many ways of excluding people. Uh, and then thirdly, my comment is that um, we, we tend to think of the Eucharist of just being at the moment that you receive Eucharist and there's not enough catechesis about being Eucharist once you leave the church door. So just all those things is just percolating within me. Sure, so on number two and three, you're right. I, I don't have anything to add. On number one, you're right. So there are some issues that are considered uh, politically relevant and others that aren't. Uh, and in all fairness, that's true in some sense on, on both sides on the aisle <laughs> in, 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 in different ways. Now, there's one fundamental issue here. It's this, is that it, it becomes, I, I hear a noise here, sorry. It becomes uh, more susceptible the choice of what issues can be talked about in church. It's much more critical in a church like in the United States, which uh, needs to survive the donation of the faithful. Because there are some parishes where talking about uh, abortion or other parishes that talk about racism that uh, 
will receive the support of uh, the parishioners. It's a problem that poor churches or, or, or churches that are supported by taxpayers' money, like in, in, in many countries, leaves that churches more free to speak. While in this country, we know that there is a system of funding churches locally at, at, at the local level that needs a certain kind of support locally. And at the highest level, we know that there are some wealthy Catholics in this country whose agenda is very clear uh, against the environment, um, against workers' unions, and so on. And they can be very convincing, uh, let's say that, okay? So their, their unlimited checkbook speaks volume. This is a very serious problem. Uh, and I agree, the choice that US bishops made in 2019, so the year before the campaign of 2020 was to declare abortion the preeminent issue. And after that, they, I mean, knowing that Donald Trump would have run as a pro-life campaign uh, and so on, so they knew what, what was going to be res the result um, of that. But you're right, there is a very idiosyncratic choice of what issues I want to talk about as a bishop or as a parish priest in my, yes. Um. Thank you. Um, Rita, you have a question? And just to say, everyone, if you could keep them really short and snappy so we can get through, <laughs> we've, we've got a lot of folks who want to speak. Yeah, I see a lot of hands. Um, thank you very much, uh, Massimo. It was really very wonderful to hear you. Um, so uh, I'll just play out this scenario as you're speaking, um, especially in this entanglement of the, our US bishops in the two party system. And if they're thinking politically, um, and I don't know like what they're thinking. The bishop, uh, Bishop Cardinal Gregory has already said he isn't going to who is the ordinary for uh, Joe Biden's parish has already said he is not going to ban him from communion. And so now you have the, you know, the executive committee issuing a statement. Let's say they do it. They say, we're gonna give this formal statement. And then you have the local Cardinal saying, no, I have the authority. And you have Pope Francis um, you know, meeting with Biden and clearly saying, let's talk about poverty. Let's talk about the climate and Catholics responsibilities there. It, it just feels like it's like a Vesuvius. But, you know, what's going to happen? I'm, you know, I know you can't okay. predict, but it, it just, you know, maybe you know something about the way some of the minds are operating on that executive committee, but it just seems like it's a, it's a mini disaster that doesn't have to happen. So whatever the USCCB uh, that says in this document, if it's approved, no one can force Cardinal Gregory to, to, to do something that he doesn't want to do first. Second, we know that if such, if such document is approved, it could uh, legitimate some actions of other bishops in, in, in other diocese, other areas of the country where President Biden might in the future travel mm -hmm. or where some Catholic politicians live. So here, uh, I am i don't think uh, it will be a problem for Joe Biden in Washington, DC. I think it could be a problem if he travels and stays uh, more than one day or over a weekend in San Francisco or in Denver. Mm -hmm. That could be a problem. So if that document is approved, the issue is bigger than just Washington DC. Also because for how the Catholic church works today, it's not unlikely to have an individual parish priest who, who her, 
heard has heard of of this document and takes matters in his hands and say well i'm following the USCCB on, on this disregarding what he his bishop says about this so it would have consequences anyway i believe um and, and there's no way that, as I said, that Pope Francis can intervene uh, dictatorially on the US bishops. The US bishops have no authority to mandate a policy in individual dioceses, but they can send a certain kind of message that, that can be interpreted by some bishops in, in a certain way. And for a Catholic idea that in the local church, the local bishop is ultimately responsible for his church. It's not imaginable that the Swiss guards will be parachuted in the diocese of Denver and they will take over. I mean, this is not. Mm -hmm. So we will see what happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Harmon, go ahead. Unmute, Mike. Mike, you have when to you, mute. There you when go. you talked I'm about mute. when you talked about you Eve, not muted. You're muted. it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. You're when okay. you were talking You're... about Eve Congar, you mentioned the eight characteristics of the attitude of the right vis-a-vis -vis integralism. So I just, what do you mean by integralism? Thank you. Sure. So integralism. <laughs> It's a particular kind of understanding uh, the Catholic faith that was typical of the 19th century, early 20th century. And we thought it was going to go away. I mean, that we we're going to be forgotten, but actually in these last few years, it has returned in this country, if, if you know some authors. So here integralism means this that one has to apply the truth of the Catholic faith integrally to the social life, to the, to, to the political life without compromises, without adaptations, without uh, concessions. Okay. Of course, this is a fiction because there's no complete package of Catholicism that you can say, okay, I have it and I will apply it here without compromises. This has never happened, okay? But that was a, a post-French revolution ideology that says we have to fight back against modernity, against atheism and so on. And the only way to do this is to reapply Catholicism integrally to our public life, to our legislation, our policies. And this is something that a few important authors, Catholic authors in this country are arguing openly. For example, I've, I've read this last year of an important Harvard professor of law, by the way, said, we should welcome migrants in this country but only Catholic migrants, not the not no Catholic ones. That is an integralist policy in his view, which happens to be anti-Christian, in my opinion. But but that is just one way to uh, translate integralism without concession, without adaptations, everything as it is, but of course, in the way I understand it, okay, because there is no a uh, perfect 100% pure Catholic message that can be, uh, not even in the Vatican. I mean, as you know, I mean, the Vatican, they don't have workers' rights. <laughs> I mean, lay workers in the Vatican have no workers' rights. And so not even in the Vatican, they are integralists. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So we've got, we've, I'm going to take three more questions and that's going to be it. So we've got Daryl Grigsby, Peter Johnstone and Sister Maureen. Uh, you'll be the last one, Sister Maureen. So go ahead, Daryl, ask your question. Okay, mine is very quick. I, that was, I, I love that. And the question is, 
Um, so how do we rise above as a church this two-party sectarianism at a local level in our parishes? So, I mean, let me say this, the Catholic Church, the church, and especially Catholicism, is political, is political, shouldn't be partisan. And it's just, so these are two different things, okay? So here, at our local level, it means to present when one speaks or preaches uh, on relevant issues, to present all issues at the same level of importance that they deserve. So here, I don't think that in a parish, there should be more prayers for the, for the Philadelphia Eagles than for Iraq. One example, <laughs> okay or the uh, Boston Red Sox or whatever. I mean, okay, so there should be an effort to be the person who represents, especially if one has a, has a role of leadership in, on all issues that are at the heart of the Catholic teaching, social issues and so on. That, is not happening when we have consciously or unconsciously adopted a two-party system where you choose automatically where you belong. That is going to make any, any church leader who does that in, the, in this country unpopular with a certain percentage of these people. There's no question about that. So there is a cost on the short term, but on the long term, I believe that it will pay in terms of authority mm. and of credibility, I believe. Mm. Excellent. Peter, go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Massimo. I should mention I'm from Australia, where, as you know, we've just completed the first assembly of our plenary council. Um, I'm fascinated in your introduction of party pol politics, um, which obviously does apply to Australia as well as to America, I'd suggest. But I wonder what you think about this proposition that really that wouldn't be such a problem if bishops were accountable. The bishops are in fact part of a very autocratic system. And certainly in Australia, there are many bishops that feel no need to consult with their people. Um, who are happy to take decisions without being in touch with their people. Um, and of course, it's also an all male hierarchy, uh, um, very much in an antiquated um, command and control model that what we need in the church is perhaps being addressed by Pope Francis's approach to synodality, um, which requires a recognition that leaders actually listen to the people around them, but that it needs to go much further than that, particularly on the issue of the inequality of women or the exclusion of women from the governance of the church. That it's that, it's that hierarchical, autocratic, all-male system, which is not good leadership and doesn't consult, that reinforces the prejudices of those people in the hierarchy and the effectiveness of those prejudices. So I, I agree with you, generally speaking. Now, I, yeah, Pope Francis has been Pope for eight and a half years. The clerical system that we have is 1,000 year old. So here there are, so there's a sheer number of years of time that we need to understand to proceed to a model that is more adequate. I have no, no, no doubt about that. Now, not all systems that are antiquated are bad. So here, for example, the papacy is very antiquated. I would choose the Roman papacy every time of every day of the, of the week and twice on Sunday compared to the Silicon Valley model of leadership. So here, 
I'm not a defensor of this system, even though I have to say I've worked much more and much better with the Australian bishops than with the US bishops. So you're right, what you are doing in Australia is frustrating, I guess, but it, it's much more than we in the US can imagine. I can assure you that. Okay, so here there is this moment. It's about pushing, 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 uh, and work for what can be achieved. Um, what's happening right now, 10 years ago, was in no one's mind, maybe God's mind, but no one could imagine what is happening now. I mean, under Pope Benedict and John Paul II, synodality or synods were a synonym of who cares? Mm -hmm. Literally, literally. Mm -hmm. So I understand your frustration, and but um, something is moving, and I don't know where it's going, but I, I also know that it will be very hard to go back to where it was before. Um, that's, that's, that's what I, I can say. Uh, um, I mean, okay. when Vatican II was opened in 1962, most experts said this council will go nowhere because the Roman Curia has a grip on everything. Nothing will happen. At Christmas, we'll all be home and nothing in 1963 will be different. Well, a few things have happened since then. Yeah. Thank you. Sister Maureen, you're the last yeah. person. Um, thank you, Massimo. Enjoyed it immensely. So good to see you. Um, my question is sort of based on the last gentleman, I think Peter, um, because you opened up by talking about the Synod. And I have been reading a great deal about it. And in every article, the word listen is probably said a thousand times that the, you know, it is to listen, to listen, to listen. I've also been doing a great deal of reading about the um, traditionalist uh, in the church today. And I'm becoming more and more aware of just how strident the voice has become in that regard. And I guess I'm, I'm asking you to guess or to look into a crystal ball. Do you see the Synod, and maybe you actually just answered the question. No one would have expected that Vatican II would have the results that it did have. So maybe, in my fear that the synod, that people won't listen. Um, maybe I should look back at Vatican II and take that example, because I want to believe that the spirit will work in the synod as it did through Vatican II. Mm -hmm. So I, so the synod between now and, and the, the next 20, uh, the 24 months, the result will be, if anything, a compromise on some issues first. Second, mm -hmm. if there's something that, that must be said is that Catholics that see themselves in the tradition of Vatican II and so on, they are open to synodality, to the idea of the, the, of the, 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 of the synod, while on the traditionally side, if you just read what they are saying, they think it's all trash. It's, it, 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 it's all something that is not worth the attention. So that is a fact. And again, I do think that on some issues, there will be a compromise with a more conservative Catholic culture locally and the national level. But um, in all, I believe that if, if Pope Francis has called the Synod, it's, be, it's out of a fundamental uh, fidelity to the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. 
in the way he sees it, of course. Okay. So there is, um, I believe that those who don't believe in the synod and in the synodality, they will in the end exclude themselves and they will try to wait out. I'm not sure this is going to work for them because um, it's a global process. Um, and if now a hierarchy that is out of touch, uh, is not respected, is not taken seriously, right now, I don't think the situation will be better in two years. Mm -hmm. uh, unless, unless, I mean, this is the game of some, so, so they plan to be the masters of a much smaller church. Uh, that is a big risk and mm -hmm. that could happen. But I mean, if we look at what's happened in these last few years after the uh, launch of the Benedict Option and all that, what has happened there? Nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea of a purer, smaller church is unworkable. Because in the end, I mean, every idea can be tested in its validity by pushing it to an extreme. So if you push that idea to an extreme, what is the extreme of, of a pure smaller church? Is a, a church made of one, which in the end, it's not something you really want to be a member of. <laughs> Really, because this is, so I believe that there's no plan there that is really alternative to the synodality. That's, that is my conviction. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Massimo, just, I have to get your opinion on this because I know you wrote a little bit about it. So at the Amazon Synod, um, you know, we had a decision, you know, bishops making recommendations. This was all supposed to become part of ordinary magisterium if they could agree. And then Pope Francis says, basically, no. <laughs> I mean, so and I'm talking about the, the idea of a married priesthood and, and even the idea of discussing women deacons. And I know you wrote about the limitations of synodality because your piece was uh, important to me at that time. How do you see that as, you know, as we move forward into this next synod process? What are the likelihood? What's the likelihood that, I know you, it's gonna be a compromise, I mean, of course, but what's the likelihood that something can actually come from the people and it will become part of, you know, ordinary magisterium or how we function, how we work. So what Pope Francis did in 2020 was for the moment, not to accept that recommendation. Mm -hmm. But for the moment, because he has really not come out strongly against that. He simply said, I don't think it was the fruit of a genuine synodal uh, decision, which I think it was his way of saying, I don't like it, but that's mm -hmm. that. Uh, so if this idea keeps coming up, it will be difficult to, to reject it. Now, if you, if you know what happened last week in France, uh, the, the commissions, report on the sex abuse crisis, one of, of, of the recommendations is to Pope Francis to go back to that suggestion of the Amazon mm -hmm. Synod and to implement as an experiment the ordination of Mary. So this is not something that has gone away. Mm -hmm. uh, if it keeps coming up, I don't think it will be easy to pretend that this idea doesn't exist. Hmm. Great, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fagioli. We are, uh, it's just been extraordinary. It's been just extraordinary. Thank you for being here.